welcome to Senate Finance um, on our end of the year marathon. And um, we're gonna push this through. We have until four o'clock this afternoon to come up with a broadband recommendations for the Appropriations Committee, which actually has possession of 966. I think everyone is trying to get out by Friday. Um, I don't know how long we'll be on the floor at four. I might ask you to come back afterwards if we don't quite get this wrapped up and I'm not seeing how we are going to, but we'll try. So commissioner, you're here. I see the clay is here. A um, couple questions came up yesterday. I'll find my notes. Um, first, any general comments um, you have? And then we wanted to talk about the, we've been told that the education department, and I know we've asked them, um, have been collecting some data on areas where they have a cluster of students they can't reach. Just trying to get a sense as to what that looks like. We've been told that you have it and it's going on your maps. So that might be helpful. And then um, any comments you wanna make and Lifeline came up yesterday. You know, we go to all this work, we hitch folks up and they can't afford the monthly fee. And just wondering, I got online with something Maria sent, but other than it's only for people under 135% of poverty, which is not that high. Um, but what that looks like, because we're gonna run all this out and then we know that the, you know, the providers have been doing some special deals, but there's no guarantee those are going to continue. And so if we get shut back down in November or January, how do we avoid having to start all over? Um, so I think those are the questions. Um, yeah, those are, I think, the base questions I had. And at present, I don't have a quorum. I have one letter sweater, one campaign photo. I'm, I'm here, I'm just making, I'll stay right here. I'm just making a little uh, lunch. You can make lunch, I just need to see you. Here okay. I am. All right. So I know I have a quorum listening. So I have one, two, three, four. All right. Okay, Commissioner, the floor such as it is, such as it is, is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the invitation to come in. And if it's at all helpful to you in the committee, I'm happy to spend the afternoon with you just hanging out on the bench in case you have an additional question later, because I know how pressed you all are for time. Um, that might be very helpful if you can do that. Just... I'm glad to do that. I did that for house energy technology as well. So I, I know we're all pulling together here. Uh, in terms of general comments, I would only observe that um, H uh, 966 was done quickly and with as much stakeholder um, involvement as I have seen in my time uh, working with the legislature over the last 20 years. I think it's impressive and I've seen your committee do similar work at a similar pace with similar breadth and um, I really think the people of Vermont can be proud of what they're seeing in their legislature. Um, this is not a perfect bill. I think uh, House Energy Technology would be the first to tell you that and we are not in perfect circumstances. Uh, from my point of view we are dealing with an emergency and while the season has changed the virus has not. And Vermont has been very fortunate and also I think very intelligent and strategic in dealing with the virus. But the fact remains that we don't know everything we would like to know in order to make more um, targeted decisions about how to use this money. So what remains on my mind is that 
Uh, some people say we're out of the first phase. Some people say we're winding down. Some people say we have a second phase coming. This commissioner has been proceeding on these policy questions from the point of view that we have an open-ended threat that this public health emergency represents, but we have federal funding that very unfortunately has constraints around it that are not helpful. And so we have to do what we can to make the best possible can of it. And I think 966 for all of its, uh, its questions and, and whatnot uh, is exactly that. Um, considering that this money was not sent to the states expressly to deal with broadband infrastructure construction, I think uh, your colleagues in the house have done a fine job of navigating those limitations to come up with something that will help people. Um, the, and specifically the people who you can help under the bill, which are principally students who are, are doing remote learning and folks who are in need of telehealth uh, and also to a limited extent, um, government workers who are doing telecom uh, telecommuting. Um, to your concerns about um, data for locating those students, I have included here today the two most recent versions of the maps that the department has generated. I don't know whether Faith is able to put them up screen, but- um, Commissioner Tierney, Clay is gonna bring those up for you. Excellent, thank you so much. Then Clay, if you would do that, please. Yeah, I'm working on it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the two maps depict uh, in the first instance, the entirety of the survey results that the department has pulled together. Um, and then secondly, the specific uh, locations of students who are in need of a connectivity solution. The survey results are um, a function of data requests that the department sent out to the supervisory unions and schools, um, data requests that the Agency of Education sent out to all schools and followed up uh, with personal outreach to the superintendents. Um, some house members have also sent out data requests to their constituents. Uh, I also did, as you may recall, a public appeal statewide on uh, statewide television at one of the governor's press conferences asking Vermonters who are in need of a connectivity solution to please contact the department. And um, we also have included the Agency of Education's uh, data that it receives in answer to its annual tech survey results of uh, survey of schools. So what you see here in front of you right now is um, the combined, uh, Clay, I can't tell what the top caption is. Can you briefly show that? Okay, so this is, the, this is the map that shows you where the students are located in the state. And um, the legend below uh, tells you on a color-coded basis which of the respondents um, have what kind of um, access and of course, what's of most um, interest under H966 are the folks who are underserved or unserved. Uh, and so the legislation is targeted at helping um, those kids. Uh, there is of course some interest in or some provision in the legislation for helping low income folks in particular, um, but the emphasis is very much on students and uh, telehealth folks because those are the um, constraints under the COVID, the, the CARES Act, basically. Um, telehealth information? Uh, we do have some t telehealth information, but we did not get a lot of that, Madam Chair. Um, the, we're, we're, we're collecting that I mostly. think they've been busy. I'm sorry, yes. Clay, go ahead. Would I would you... say, yes, uh, they've been busy. And you know, um, uh, several issues, uh, including privacy, um, have, have cropped up, which I think have limited the response. So most of our telehealth is through um, through uh, the survey that we've issued, uh, people self-identifying. Um, but we've also gotten a little bit of pushback that, hey, everybody is a patient, and certainly someone in my family is a patient in any given day, uh, you know, especially if you have children. Um, and so that the idea that patients, being a patient is not an immutable trait, it's something that people kind of go in and out of um, is, is something that um, 
that I think that we're grappling with. But um, I wanted to also point out that the text survey is something that will be going out in a couple of weeks. So we anticipate getting um, more data directly from schools uh, than we have now. And as I'm looking at my notes here right now, Madam Chair, uh, we had approximately 1,100 specific uh, K through 12 student responses, as opposed to 14 individuals who contacted us for telehealth purposes and 13 providers who contacted us for telepurposes. So what the, the H96, 966 does is it makes it possible to bring connectivity solutions to either population, but it is quite clear that we have more granular data about students than we do about patients. And Clay's absolutely right. Uh, there is that challenge of, you know, what do you do about the, the mutability of, um, of folks needing care? Uh, shall I move on or did you want me to? Well, I'm looking at this. Yes. This is easier to read than when I brought it up I think in an email before, but I still have trouble differentiating between the D green circles and the green circles with the black around it. It looks, the one thing that's surprising is we seem to have a large cluster of served by 25-3 up, I can't see what town, yeah. it's north of St. It must be Swanton, it's north of St. Albans. Um, yeah, we're, 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 we're getting a lot of data from people that are within a cable or fiber plant and to that that signals that the issue there is affordability okay and not physical access okay i mean service. it's just that there's a cluster there um but there is a you know there isn't a similar cluster in Burlington or Shelburne. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not surprised by the unserved, um, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I think I'm, or the, yeah, the four one, I just found it interesting that there was a very large cluster of, in an area I might not have expected there to be, but something's, going right up there. We have a lot of towns that don't have any dots. Um, are there no students there or just no data? I would be very hesitant to speculate about that. Uh, from our point of view, we don't have any data to register here. As Clay said, though, we are expecting more data from uh, the annual tech surveys when they come back that the school districts do. But uh, look, this, is, this is what we have to date could find a couple of areas almost in a straight line. There's probably a mountain in there somewhere um, yeah. of red and orange dots um, that we could target. If yeah, possible. well, for, for instance, to your point, um, Madam Chair, if you go to the right side of the state in the Northeast Kingdom area, uh, this is where in the Kingdom East School District, where they have 1,800 students. Um, there are 150 who've been identified as not having good connectivity. And that's the home of the project that uh, I think I've mentioned to you before, where a consortium of um, Northeast uh, of New England um, Wireless and uh, Cloud Alliance and um, Velco and um, others, as I recall, are able to put together a wireless solution very quickly, I think, that is estimated to cost between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars and $300,000. That and would be, and this kind of mapping has helped us find that kind of, um, of that, that kind of project. We're hopeful with uh, funding that others could be found as well. And those would all fit under the $11 million bucket, we think. In the um, in the in the H nine sixty six bill, and then of course uh, there's also the line extension program that the bill includes that would help with some of these uh, more dispersed um, locations that you see. Okay, that's not a CUD, is it? 
It is not. But I should add, you know, EC Fiber, for instance, who is a CUD, has been doing um, work in this area, meaning extending its lines and the like uh, throughout the emergency. And they've also been uh, giving breaks to the students in those homes in terms of subscriptions and the like. So we do have a model for that. And I would fully expect that EC Fiber would seek to avail itself of the H966 funding and can produce good results. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, could I ask the commissioner a question? Yes. The, the commissioner, the House bill has, I don't know, in total 14 and a half or 15 and a half million. Um, would you say that's the most you think you can get out the door or if we found more money, um, do you think there's utility in trying to give you a bigger pot? That's a very good question, Senator Pearson. Uh, these amounts are not targeted at what we think we can do within the time period as much as uh, from my end, uh, I was asked to plan for a $20 million um, appropriation. That's the guidance I received from the administration. And uh, I did that. And then the House um, followed its guidance. Um, I am afraid we're in the position where we're not able to assess um, granularly how much can be done in the period of time available. The, the assumption has to be instead, how much money are we willing to take from the 1.25 billion and put it toward this particular purpose, recognizing that this has to be done before December 20, I think, uh, for state government purposes and December 31st. So if you gave us more money, we would certainly uh, do our level best. But I think it's fair to say as a matter of common sense that the more dollars you're putting out there for, or the bigger the project with dollars, uh, the more the planning lead time is and the like. And we're probably stretching things to, uh, to spend much more. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, um, and I think the Senate is considering a number closer to 20 million, so you may get uh, brightened up yet. Um, the other question I have, I, I happen to think that these investments, if done well, and, and that's not an easy task, are some of the smartest responses we can do because it does build resilience across our communities as we are sadly recognizing the pandemic is not going to neatly um, tie itself up by the end of summer. Um, on the affordability of service question, that is a big question and it is a real problem to Vermonters and perhaps your map is suggesting uh, some of the locations where it's a particularly a problem. But I'm worried that there are monies in the House proposal to basically subsidize the costs of connection. Um, and I, I guess I'd be curious on your feedback. I, this sounds sort of cold, but helping somebody get internet for four months doesn't exactly seem like much of a solution to me. In fact, it, it only highlights a cruelty when that funding goes away in January. And I, I'm just wondering if you have thoughts on that and, and if you're convinced that that is a wise use of these dollars. Oh, Senator, I think um, I, I think what all of us who are working in this area are having to deal with is um, that there are far too few resources and the need is great. And I'm not talking just about connectivity. Frankly, what hurts me regularly is when I see those food lines and see that we have people in our state, as I understood it, one in three, who are not secure with food. So there are very difficult decisions that have to be made. 
And I think it is wise to take some portion of this money and put it toward this problem um, for one, because it can serve as a block among several in solving our long-term connectivity issues, but also because we have to confront the immediate problem of knowing that there are kids who are at home who need to be able to access school. And we've seen there are too many who are not able to. What our, our data investigation has uh, shown us is that you have competing problems, the affordability issue and the infrastructure issue. They both are worthy and there are resources that have been put toward the affordability issue, but they're not adequate. And what's deeply troubling to me is that they're voluntary. Uh, we're depending entirely on the good graces of um, major companies who are under the jurisdiction of the FCC to keep America connected during the pandemic. Now, um, I'm pleased to observe that they have twice now, in the first instance, they took the pledge, and in the second instance, they agreed to extend it. But, you know, this is no way to run a necessary public service. At the end of the day, though, I've spent many years in my career making difficult decisions based on laws. You've spent many years making difficult decisions based on your judgment as a legislator. Where I come from, uh, the way I resolve this is we've got to get the infrastructure built. We can find other ways to deal with the affordability issue, but it's the cost of infrastructure that proves prohibitive. And it's not to say it's the only problem and the only expenditure you could make, but I think it's a, a wise one with these resources. Thank you for not saying I've spent years making difficult laws. I appreciate no, I, it. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I happen to agree with your assessment there. Thank you. Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Do we talk to us a little bit about um, the, I'm losing the, not the connectivity fund, the um, lifeline. Yes. What can I tell you about For, for broadband. Um, yes. Do we know, how many people do we have on that? Do we know, um, did we pick up new ones during this crisis? Are we reaching out to the folks that are getting, you know, the three, the freebies from the providers so that they know there are options when the providers go away? So let me take the first mm -hmm. uh, piece of that. We are reaching out. We have been um, maintaining the web page at the web at the department and um, trying to keep that you know current and when we take calls from people and the overwhelming preponderance of public contacts that we've had during the pandemic have been from people about broadband service and the like this is the kind of thing that we discuss with them but uh, clay will correct me if i'm wrong but i don't believe we have um, good data about who is on broadband lifeline <laughs> There is a federal broad, there is a federal lifeline program yeah. for broadband, but um, I, I don't know that we have good data. Clay, perhaps you can yes. add to that. Um, we do have some data on lifeline generally. Um, as you know, there's a state and federal lifeline program. I'm sorry, I'm sitting low, so you're just yeah, that's okay. Head. Okay, there you go. Um, <clears throat> so there's a state and federal lifeline program. The state program covers uh, telephone service only, so it doesn't do internet. That's and it what piggybacks, I thought, and then I heard there was broadband. It piggybacks on the federal program. The federal program has a, uh, a voice or a broadband component. So you can pick if you want voice or broadband. Voice is being sunset in 2021, so um, you, after 2021, it'll only be broadband. Most consumers are opting these days for a wireless lifeline product, which comes with a cell phone and voice and data. And that's all done federally. Uh, the state has no involvement in that. Recently, the FCC instituted a couple of new measures. One's called the National Verifier, and uh, the other one's called NLAD, the National Lifeline uh, 
I'm sorry, I can't remember what the acronym is, but both of these programs are designed to ensure that Lifeline recipients um, meet the qualifications and that they're not taking multiple Lifeline accounts. Uh, unfortunately, it has had the effect of administratively choking the program. So we've actually seen a decline in people qualifying for Lifeline service because of the national verifier. And so Vermont uh, last year was pushed into the national verifier program. Uh, we were able to get a slight delay, but now we're, we're in it. We have a few Lifeline providers that do broadband in Vermont. Most notable is Burlington Telecom. Uh, the ILEX also do Lifeline for both voice and broadband. Um, so if you're a consolidated customer, a Franklin Telephone customer, or a, a Waitsfield Champlain customer, um, you should be able to get that. The credit is for uh, $10. So um, it doesn't go a whole, uh, doesn't go very far in buying a broadband subscription. You get, you get $10. Um, off the okay. subscription. So the wireless though, those prices are usually set at $10. So if you opt for the wireless um, Lifeline package, it's generally free. Okay. All right, Senator Brock. Madam Chair. Uh, just a, a question for uh, uh, Commissioner Tierney. Uh, have, to what extent have you been able to survey uh, the various providers in terms of what their capability is to be able to extend broadband in their various ways uh, by December 30? Do you have any feel for that? Um, I do have a feel for it. Um, I can't say that we have done a survey. I typically meet with uh, companies and keep a finger on the pulse of things. Uh, my feel of it is that they're going to be challenged. There's a supply issue that I mentioned to the committee, I think in, in late April, or early May. Is this a issue of uh, fiber? Yes, indeed. Um, this is what Kim Gates of Franklin Telephone has highlighted more than once. Uh, the back orders are such now to where fiber is generally available or thought to be available in September. But um, Velco, I know, has uh, acquired quite a bit of fiber for its purposes, and I am having discussions with them as well about what they might be able to do in the connectivity realm, but that isn't anything that fits into H966. So um, we've been in touch with GMP, and GMP is amenable to accelerating pull make ready work with the understanding that it will mean uh, giving that priority over other things that it needs to be doing as well. But you know, everybody's sort of in that mode right now of uh, let's deal with the emergency and let's do what we can for Vermonters in addressing this need. But uh, I'm not able to give you a systematic company by company assessment of what they could do. The approach here is very much make resources available and see who is going to use them. And I have a high degree of confidence that uh, we will have takers, but I'm afraid we don't have the more granular um, view that you're looking for, Senator. Should we, uh, on a more immediate basis, uh, seek uh, at least informal information from providers as to what they're able to accomplish? And wouldn't that help guide us in terms of which buckets of money? We, we I think for, for legislative purposes, uh, I can understand why you would want that. Um, from my point of view as their supervisory regulator, these are ongoing businesses that are doing the, the work that they have to do anyway. And so there's a limit to my ability to take them away from that, to say, what could you do when? And these folks are, you know, as serious um, businesses and um and operatives in their industry, they're not going to give me a casual answer. They're going to want to take time to study and give um, a more precise assessment. So I, I can do that, but um, I'm afraid you're not going to have that in time to make the decisions that you Four o'clock. Yeah, okay. these, are, these are judgment can calls. I add to, to oh, you. Ahead, of suppliers and, and people that you have in your universe 
uh, to look at. Uh, is it fair to say that you are agnostic in terms of technology or are you focused on specific technologies yeah. in terms of how you prioritize funds, particularly if you're given more freedom to do that? Well, uh, Senator, from my point of view, um, there are, are two, there, there's, there are my views as a substantive expert in the field. And then there is the view I hold as a regulator who is charged with implementing the laws that the legislature has adopted. The legislature has voiced a very clear preference for fiber and certain speeds. And so I am um, absolutely mindful of my obligation uh, to ensure that I'm supporting projects of that nature. Uh, as a substantive expert, uh, I am agnostic. I think the point here is to get connectivity to Vermonters or a point. I would add to that though, though, that the state has also expressed a very clear commitment to communications union districts who overwhelmingly favor fiber solutions and are not technology agnostic. And from my point of view as a substantive expert, the CUDs are filling the role of what we call a carrier of last resort in the telephone world. They are who we have turned to to fill a gap that the market's not going to fill for an essential service. And what the CUDs are telling you across the board is fiber is their answer. Now, this conversation that we've been having since April when we first started on the emergency broadband action plan um, discussion has shown that people are, are working very hard to find common ground, recognizing that we're not going to get fiber to the premises 100 symmetrical tomorrow or by the end of the year. So I think there has been some recognition that there can be wireless solutions that can serve and that can be complementary to a communication union district's plans in the long term to have fiber. And there also, I think, as a matter of intellectual integrity, has to be recognition that there are some locations in the state where a fiber solution is just not economic and there would need to be some willingness to entertain something other than that. But by and large, I think the consensus among stakeholders is pulling toward seeing that we get to robustly support a communications union districts who will perform the role of carrier of last resort, which means to ensure that everybody has a connectivity access solution. There's a preference and recognition of our terrain uh, and the like that we ought to have fiber, that that is the investment that would most likely give us the most bang for the buck over the next 20, 30 years. And there also may be a need to employ on a short-term basis. And in this case, we're talking, you know, probably a five-year time frame. We would need to, on a short-term basis, adopt um, interim solutions such as wireless coverage. So I apologize if I've gone on too long, but uh, that would be how I'd answer your question. Well, I know I have additional questions, but I see that Senator Champion has been anxiously uh, awaiting. So perhaps let, 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 let him in first and maybe I'll come back later. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Brock. Madam Chair, may I, may I have the floor? Madam Chair, we cannot hear you very well, Madam Chair. Oh. Yes, Okay. can okay. have the floor. Uh, so I guess uh, my question, one is for the chair and then following uh, that with the commissioner. And my question regarding the letter that we're, we're drafting or the recommendations, Madam Chair, we could write that we support what the House is doing and leave it at that. That's that's one of the things that's yes. in the realm of possibility. Okay. Yeah. And so, Madam, so uh, Commissioner, uh, good afternoon. Good to see you. Likewise. I, I don't see any Munich or I. Look oh no, this this is Munich. This okay. is this is my everyday picture. Uh, so, um, so is would your recommendation be to us to do exactly that? It sounds like from earlier on today you were mentioning your support for the House's efforts. Um, and, and you feeling good that it's a good bill. And so is that, would you look for any changes at this point that you might point us into in terms of what we would put forward as a recommendation to appropriations? I would be hesitant to recommend changes because I 
at this point, I'm very respectful of the difficulty of the decisions you're facing as legislators. Um, I would note that H-966 is largely consistent with phase one of the emergency broadband action plan that my department continues to, um, to refine and, and work with stakeholders on, because don't forget, you know, I'm very much focused on having a plan that the state can get behind for the eventuality of federal funding should we be able to get that. So everything in phase one of that plan is pretty much in 966. I do listen to your deliberations, just as I listen to those of House Appropriations, Joint Fiscal, Senate Economic, um, and, and the like. So I, I try to follow your conversations so that I can be as responsive as possible uh, when you have me in like this. That's been, uh, for me, uh, one of the benefits of Zoom, frankly. Um, and I have heard concern in your committee about um, establishing guidance and the like for how um, the department or if you, I, I think there was some conversation yesterday about having somebody other than the department uh, do these functions. So I, I could recommend to you as a matter of, of clinical guidance, as opposed to a member of the Scott administration, that you, um, you pursue that if that will give you greater comfort in, in um, getting behind H966 if there are priorities that you want to um, ensure are met through uh, specific guidance to uh, the, the authorities that would wind up dispersing this money. But beyond that, you know, push come to shove, I think that's what you're asking me, Senator. I would recommend that you adopt this bill. Um, the, the bill, you know, Vermont was, was faster out of the gate than most states in recognizing the very narrow grounds on which this money could be used for broadband purposes. And um, you know, we've done a lot of work since then as a state to come up with what's now embodied in that bill. I keep an eye on what's going on in other states. And when I have seen other states doing other things, and please don't ask me to come up with details because there's a limit to what I can remember. But my impression is that when I see them doing other things, it's because they're being more aggressive in their willingness to challenge the treasury guidance on the use of the money. And my understanding is that we're facing a substantial revenue shortfall already for the coming year. And so our margin to be wrong and have this money clawed back simply is not very, uh, very broad. So I think H966 is probably the safest way and um, frankly, um, a very shrewd way to make progress on your policies. Thank you. Um, and, and if I may, just one quick follow up before uh, returning to Senator Brock. Uh, so one of the things that I think uh, we're all interested in is supporting our CUDs. Uh, I, we received some emails over the past 24 hours or since we last met <clears throat> yesterday from our various CD, CUDs talking about what they've accomplished um, their goals, it seems to me that a number have accomplished a lot in a very short period of time. Do you feel as though we are sufficiently supporting them uh, as is written at, at this point? I think you are supporting them as much as you can, given the very short time frame and the constraints on the uses of the money. They, the, the CUDs that can participate have an open door to participate in what's available under 966. The unfortunate fact is the pandemic has hit at a time when so many of the CUDs are still in their formative stage. But phase two of the emergency plan that the department is working on carves out a significant role for the CUDs. And in addition to that, in my conversations with the federal delegation, I have also been stressing that um, you know, if, if, if the project that is outlined in the emergency plan isn't um, one that can be funded um, by the federal government for whatever reasons, that another concept the federal government should very carefully consider is looking at what Vermont's doing with CUDs because it is a model that lends itself to export to other states. And that is frequently what becomes decisive in pulling down federal funding for a pilot project. So I, I don't think every decision that this body makes is a referendum on whether 
we're helping the cuts to the max. I think the decision facing you this afternoon is how can you best make use of these emergency funds? And for the CUDs, in addition to their ability to participate, I think the operative principle has to be do no harm. And that is the purpose fundamentally, I think, behind the provision that has the CUDs um, providing a letter of, of approval um, for, for projects that are proposed in their service territories. It's giving right. them a say. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Senator Brown. Yeah a veto power though isn't it unless they say okay my my reading of it is that they have 30 days to get um a recommendation in and after 30 days we're able to act and maybe i need to read it more closely i, I can do that if you like i'm still work i'm still working my way through the the full yeah, bill I, I didn't i didn't see it as an absolute bar but maybe i'm but, uh, clay I yeah because my my question mm -hmm. was, we've got a formative CUD. We've got the ability through another provider to provide 50 people with broadband within, you know, in 25.3, not fiber, but, you know, within two months, we could get 50 homes and 50 kids hooked up. And the CUD is still formative. It might never get off the ground. It might not be able to get anything out there for two years. And so on the other hand, if that provider is taking off the one straight road with the densest mileage in the district, it's going to, um, impact their ability in the future. And so I'm wondering how, how do we balance that? Um, yeah. Or how do we give you guidance so you can balance that? And where does it, because I'm not sure I'm comfortable saying to a bunch of kids, you can't get hooked up. You got to drive down to the local Walmart at seven in the morning to download your your email and say hi to your teacher, you know, at the local hotspot, and then go home and have no connectivity if we get shut down again for a couple months in the winter. Um, so yeah. I, it, you know, it, it's current versus future, and how do we balance that? Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's a very, very apt um, scenario in terms of capturing the tensions. And what I would encourage you to do is focus on probabilities. We have at this point a window of six months. We're and, going to tell you to focus on probabilities. And, and we will faithfully execute. Um, I, I think there needs to be some trust here that, um, that the, I, I have been having some very serious and frank conversations with industry, uh, Comcast in particular, where I have told them repeatedly in very plain spoken English, you need to make friends with the CUDs. And they have an example of having had success in working cooperatively with the municipalities in, um, in Massachusetts. My understanding is that the individual who spearheaded that is relatively new to Comcast. She is a former regulator. She's a former me in another state. And she has been quite candid with me about recognizing that the CUDs aren't going away. They don't quite know what to make of the CUDs, which is why I have been doing some serious thinking and come to the conclusion that they are best characterized as the carrier of last resort. And the carrier of last resort doesn't go away. The carrier of last resort is a fact that needs to be dealt with. And industry through its market dynamics has picked those places that now need help and they can either be part of the solution or not be part of the solution. And I think that I wouldn't foreclose the possibility that there can be constructive dialogue between a CUD that is nascent but that otherwise would have that carrier of last resort mission and a, an industry participant who can deliver that 50 person solution you're talking about if it's out there. 
So the cud, the cud. I've got are, Senator Pearson. Last and word, I'm just. You, you, the I can't cud see is the last talking. Resort. I'm just. I'm got, trying to, I've, I've got Senator Pearson and then Senator McDonald. No, Senator. I didn't Brock. understand what and, the commissioner meant. That's all. What is a cud? It's a yeah. communications union district. Is that the commission, the, the last resort, or is the last resort. Resort. Yes, the cut. I you. see the cuds as the the provider of Thank last you. resort. Thank right, you. they are the the old local telephones that have to provide the service, the lifeline service, out into the mountains, whether or not it is cost effective. Uh, um, I I defer cut. to Brock if I'm in the no. but I'd yeah. like to be in the queue. Pardon? I defer okay. to Senator Brock, but I'd like to be somewhere in the queue. Okay, you're next. Senator Thank Brock. You. Uh, Commissioner, uh, let's talk about <clears throat> timeline a little bit. Based on what you see in this bill, how do you envision the timeline working vis-a-vis -vis carrier selection uh, and, uh, and the beginning of work? Well, uh, we, in my department at least, assuming that we're the ones entrusted with the mission, uh, we met on Monday to discuss this very issue and to inventory our assets. Uh, it will mean a redirection, immediate redirection of our work for the time being. We have um, at least 10 very experienced grant administrators on staff and uh, attorneys as well. Um, so we would need to be pushing out a number of practices and regulations and the like envisioned in H966 in very short order. We would then need to be standing up a request for proposal process for the Connect Vermonters and Now part, I think, of H966. Um, you know, that, that would proceed in tandem with our preparing the rules and regulations to the extent that it can. But I would envision that that would need to get out probably by at the latest um, the third week of July, maybe the end of July, with your standard 30 day response time um, and then state contracting and the like. The, the, it is a heavy lift, there's no question. But um, assuming that all those things were to fall into place, you're probably looking at having those projects in the, in the, in the connectivity uh, initiative piece of the bill. Uh, starting uh, construction in August, uh, September, that time, well, in September. Um, the line extensions probably could proceed more quickly. That also would be you know, another practice and procedure drafting uh, task that we would have to achieve. Um, also, I would our target uh, July 15. And um, then it's a question of folks applying to the department um, for that aid, and uh, the company's moving a pace and coming up with their um, their construction schedules, which I would expect to carry them through the end of the year. Well, as you have experience with doing all of these kinds of things or having all of these things done, mm -hmm. done, is it realistic to assume that once you make a decision sometime in September uh, to award a contract to a vendor to lay cable? given the delay in getting cable in the first place, is it reasonable that any construction would actually start, much less be finished by the end of November? Because as a practical matter, wintertime, you're not putting in poles. Senator, I can't argue with, um, with what you're pointing out. I think this bill is very much about what is possible, not what is um, predictable, what is certain. I mean, the, the safest thing to do would be, frankly, to not award any of this money and to just use it for something else. But I don't think that is, um, I don't think that is what Vermonters are asking for, frankly. They want us to try. And I think, or I think we can do more than just try here. I think we have a pretty good prospect of succeeding for some Vermonters at least. But I will be the first to concede to you that there are heavy lifts ahead, as you've just identified. Is well, it realistic? I think it is within the realm of realism. I'm just a little concerned that we're first going to learn about what the capabilities are of the vendors once we receive their proposals, as opposed to having sought what their capabilities are in a, a less formal process to begin with before we go down this road of committing this, this time, expense, and so on. 
I guess the second question that I have is, as far as the relevant technologies, uh, and although uh, we certainly want fiber to the home as an ultimate solution, if that's not a practical solution, given the construction uh, and also uh, the, the component issues, uh, delays, uh, is uh, more of a focus on wire, uh, on, on wireless, uh, does that make more sense? Because it evidently is something that can be done more quickly. Have you, have you, have you examined that as an issue? I have given it some thought, yes. I think that is precisely why I backed the Northeast Kingdom project. It was the very first one that um, was, was drawn up in response to my call to action among the utilities in April 10. So yes, I have given it some thought, a lot of thought. But I also think that it's clear that wireless solutions are not uh, optimal for the state. And so to the extent that good solutions can be had in the time frame using fiber, I think this is an opportunity to do that, especially if you're talking about a situation where the fiber's in the neighborhood, but somebody has not been able to afford the capital investment of $3,000 to get the line extended, but with it extended can afford the $100 a month subscription or the the lesser um, subscription that's available so i think I, th I think the thing to do is to put money on both and I, I hope i've been clear about that would it make more sense in our present in this bill to break down uh, the separation between the two uses of funds and put them in a single pool but give the department discretion as to how to allocate them based on uh, the availability of, of, of vendors to be able to meet the need and also to evaluate the need, because right now it looks like you don't really know what the need is. I, th these are not judgments I am prepared to make, Senator. I know that I've had the conversations with the industry players, and I know that the industry players have said to a person that I've talked to that they want to do for Vermont what they can do. And what has been styming me at this point in my conversations is I've had no resources to assure them with. If Would I had been be... able to say, I've got money, please go out and do this, I could have things done, but I've not been able to do that. And until I have money, I can't justify asking those folks to spend the time with their drawing boards and their pencils to come up with projects. So Would you prefer that flexibility that I mentioned? Uh, frankly, if you give us that flexibility, I'm going to wind up using the standards that are in the bill right now for a line extension. I'll, I'll be looking at that PUC rule. And for a project like the Northeast Kingdom, we'll be looking at the merits of that project. Um, I honestly, I don't have a good way to say to you that 13 million combined is better than 11 and 2 million. Uh, that's a judgment I would defer to you on. In terms of accomplishing the goals of this bill, are you adequately resourced in terms of staffing and the types of staff that you need to be able to do this in a time effective manner? What I am prepared to do is marshal the resources of my agency and I have full confidence in my agency. They are a very high performing cast of individuals who have done this kind of work over and over to the benefit of Vermonters for many years. Are they, are we adequately staffed? This is not, you know better than I do, this entire committee, that this is not what the department was set up to do. But we are going to be responsive to Vermonters and I think we will deliver a performance that you can be proud of. Let me yield to Senator Pearson, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, just so you know, at the very beginning when you speak, it's hard to hear you and then somehow your computer comes. Oh, I come in? All right. Um, I haven't moved anything. I've got the volume up. No, no, it's just a quirk of remote work, I guess. Uh, Commissioner, I want to go back to the CUDs um, and something the chair mentioned that I agree with, and that is a concern around this so-called sort of veto power and you're saying it's not, as I read the language, it does seem like it is. I wanna support the CUDs and I definitely don't wanna undermine them. Um, but I 
am concerned that um, this maybe goes a little too far. And so I've been trying to think about um, just writing some kind of condition into the grant program that we're asking you to structure that would make it clear that line extensions can't jeopardize a CUD. In other words, if, and especially if we hope that there are significant federal dollars coming in, let's say in March, we don't want to have, we've invested in ourselves, we all agree in the extreme value of a CUD. And then just in March, we get the money to fund them in a way that will be hugely beneficial. And then we turn around and say, well, actually, you know, this town, we just stripped out 200 of its potential customers because of the line extension work we hurried through to in October. So my question is, I've been trying to wrestle with some language that would say, you know, line extensions are fine, except in the event that they could be seen to be competitive with um, CUDs. Now we enter the problem that the chair identified, which is some CUDs are on paper. Some have had a, a formalizing, uh, but haven't put a single pole in the ground. There's a whole range of where they are and some are up and running, obviously. Um, is there a distinction that you could think of, or maybe Mr. Purvis, where, you know, we could say, uh, as long as it's not competing with a CUD that is at least at point X in the iteration of the CUD development, does, it, does my question make sense? Did you have any I think, idea? Yes, it does. It makes a world of sense. So what you're trying to do is solve the problem on the fly and, since I've been doing that now for several months, welcome aboard. Um, but except I know you've been on your own flight, so I I'm, guess I'm waving to you as our planes uh, meet in the, in the air. Just to give you comfort, I've had a chance to look at the language about the veto, and I can see why you're seeing it that way. I was focused on the fact that there's an either or provision in there. Um, it's, it says we can't make the award unless after having provided notice to the project, the CUD provides a letter of support or having provided the notice, there's been nothing coming back from them. So that's not exactly a, a veto, but you're quite right. If they do choose to express themselves affirmatively about the project and it's anything other than support, then this language would foreclose us from making that award. That is correct. So turning to your, um, to your question about how to reconcile things, if we had more time, we could be thinking about language going in here that, for instance, requires the, if it's an entity other than the CUD that has um, built the line, there could be language in there that requires them to transfer the line to the CUD after a certain point. Uh, that would be an idea that I would have, for instance. Um, but I, I really that. think I beg your pardon, Madam Chair. Can do that because that was the thing that I had thought of, and then said, "Well, I mean, I assume there'd be money that would change hands to transfer the line, and I would assume we might be able to put a fence around the money, so it's well, it is a state grant, and the state can impose its obligations. Okay, okay, um, so we can do take. that. All right." I mean, uh, my, I guess my, my point would be it's well worth examining. Um, I, I hope you'll recall that um, in this position, I'm not practicing law. So I, I wouldn't want to be giving you a legal opinion right now, but uh, it's, it's some, those kinds of things perhaps could have been thought about. But again, we've got a six month window here. And um, I think it is very clear to me, this commissioner understands um, absolutely clearly that the CUDs are a serious public policy initiative that, um, that, that we want to see prosper. And so I don't envision making decisions that would be harmful to CUDs. I mean, that would pose an existential threat to them. And I seriously doubt that there is something like that that um, 
is going to materialize in the next six months. And that really is all we're talking about. What I would strongly suggest, Senator Pearson, is that as we continue to work through devising a proposal for eventual federal funding, that these be issues that we, you know, with, that we tease out and make sure that we're comfortable with. So I'm, I'm happy to discuss that with you anytime you choose. I was thinking about the lines and not, you know, you can put them in as long as if and when the CUD gets up and running, they can purchase them or use them or whatever. You which, could have a, a right of first refusal in there, for instance. Yeah, Something which like would that. be probably easier to administer than saying you have a right to veto as long as you can, you know, uh, provide the service in a reasonable amount of time because what's reasonable if schools shut down in January and February and you're snowed in and can't get to the hot spot, um, those parents are not going to be very happy with us if we stopped a reasonable thing. I had Senator Campion. Uh, okay, I got Clay, then Campion, can then I, can I Brock. Just chime in on that issue. Um, and June, my apologies, apologies in advance. I'm going to disagree there. I just don't think uh, knowing the carriers that are probably most able to take advantage of this money, I just don't see them doing that if there's the possibility that they'll lose control of the line in five years or two years. So I, I worry about carriers uh, participating. Um, oh, I appreciate what you're saying, the, Clay. The, I, the, I do. Yeah. The, sec the second issue, uh, I, I appreciate the what the House is trying to do uh, with this notice to the CUDs. Um, the six months that we have, I think as Senator Brock has already pointed out, is incredibly tight as it is. Losing an additional 30 days there, it, I, I think it makes it from extremely difficult to impossible. So to the extent that that notice could be just reduced to something like 10 days. Um, and I'm sure I've upset the entire CUD community just now, but um, time is in very short supply and losing a month um, waiting for a response from the CUDs, I think could be um, very problematic. So as you can see, Madam Chair, uh, we have robust conversations in my department and my telecom director is not a shrinking violet. So we do, I would distinguish though between the two things he and I are saying, because what Clay has told you is his assessment of what is likely to happen with the carriers. What I was telling you is what you could do. And yeah. it is, it is, you know, it, it is entirely possible that there comes a point when you put so many restrictions or conditions on funding that a carrier says no thanks. That's that's possible. Yeah, but I, uh, I think that's how I would harmonize the two things you just heard. Yeah, they're not gonna do it out of the goodness of their heart, especially if cable is hard to get and they could use that cable more profitably. So, um, Madam Chairman. Uh, right. But now I've got, I think Senator Campion, then Pearson, then Brock. I think that's it. I don't have Pearson. Campion, then Brock. It's an auction. Commissioner, my uh, comments really, it's a bit of a reiteration from yesterday, if you didn't hear them. And that's, I do feel like the current providers uh, have failed to really bridge this this divide, this uh, technology divide that we have. And it's, I feel as though their plans are not supporting rural Vermont. So I just... I don't want you all to see the long-term interests of Vermont or Vermonters um, to the current providers. So I just, <clears throat> it's something I said several times yesterday. I just want to repeat it. I, I, I'm afraid that if we do, we're going to be right back in this same position in the next pandemic. And so uh, that's, yeah. that's the big well piece. Uh, yeah, no, I, I hear you, Senator, and um, I, I hope I can give you some reassurance on that point. Um, I, 
I heard you very loudly yesterday when you were saying you felt the Cuds are under attack. And I almost called you last night to say, can you tell me a little more about what's behind that statement so I can understand it? But to be sure, um, I, I don't think that anything's going to happen in the next six months that's going to pose an existential threat to the Cuds. If nothing else, this commissioner is a backstop to that. Right. I, if I thought something was going to be proposed that would have that impact, uh, I have been a very strong advocate for the CUDS. So that's not what I'm looking at. But I would urge all of us here to consider that the priority right now, from my point of view, is the Vermonter who has no access, the Vermonter who has no internet, who's going to go to one of those Wi-Fi spots that I know Senator Cummings is not enamored of, but at least we got them out there. Better than nothing. It's telemedicine right. that I'm having problems with from your automobile, but yeah, apparently well, I it happens. You. I, I, I hear it you. It happens. But, uh, you know, what, what I think H966 is directed at is uh, the kind of constituent contact that you had, um, Senator Cummings, and that I received as well. Uh, from the individual in Worcester whose two kids have been going to a hot spot yeah. uh, and they've been idling in their car for hours at end because their connectivity at home just doesn't cut it. And H966, I think. And I've got the same thing from well, Montpelier, I believe. I've got the same thing from Waterbury. Yeah. Um, there, there are people we can help. There um, are people yeah. we could help and they aren't all in the kingdom. Um, and they probably have the resources to come up with the rest of the capital and to pay for the system. And we have some short-term gifts which are, which are targeted at short-term returns. Yeah. And in the short run, this money is meant to get as many students or people that use telemedicine, which is much harder because of all the confidentiality to map, impossible really. Um, Here are the top search results. To, yeah. um, you know, just, uh, we're threading the needle. How do we get the, the most service out to the most people doing the least amount of harm to where we want to go? Because a lot of this money in the House bill is targeted towards fiber. Yeah. But if you can't get the fiber, then I think we need to say, where is that money going to go? If fiber is in short supply, um, do, do we just say, okay, that money's gonna go to the unemployment insurance fund, which I believe is the receiver of last resort, um, of all of these <laughs> funds. Well, um, judging by what I've heard, yes. That's yeah. right. <laughs> no doubt they need the extra funds. So, um, you know, is that what's going to happen on December 20th if we're still sitting on top of 20 or $30 million because we couldn't get the cable and we couldn't use the money or we couldn't get the fiber and we couldn't use the money to do wireless or we could, you know, we've put so many restrictions up looking for the perfect. I don't think those school kids that are still trying to work on 4-1 um, are going to thank us and neither are their parents. And so it, it, I'm trying to find that balance. And right now I have 14 minutes uh, because well, I, I think our guest speakers place, are starting yeah. to arrive. So no, where, where um, I, um, I continue, I think, to disagree with my telecom director is that um, I, I have um, greater confidence that industry will do what it can within the parameters that you prescribe. And Clay may well prove me wrong. But the point is, you have to make a, a qualitative judgment here about what to do. And um, uh, Madam Chair, I think the failure would be if you made no resources available. Okay, I'm going to do Senator Ballant because Senator Brock, you've had a couple bites of the apple here. So I just want to get something clear in my own head, uh, Commissioner. 
There is nothing currently correct that's stopping the CUDs, uh, or rather stopping providers from collaborating with the CUDs right now, correct? That is I mean, correct. So there's no impediment and I just want to, so, so they, they haven't done it yet, they've been able to. Yeah. And so I think this is our distrust, frankly. Understood. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's no impediment. I'm, the only thing I can say to you is that as recent as last week, I was on the phone with their very capable lobbyists, once again, driving home the point that you must make friends with the cuts. So I, my, I guess my point is this, um, given the, the tradition, the professional tradition I come from of being an adjudicator, being a hearing officer, it does not come easy to me to make suppositions about people's character. And so I resist uh, drawing policy on the basis of whether I think somebody's a good guy or bad guy, unless they have a background and a, a, rec a record that tells me you know, once burned, uh, whatever the saying is, I forget. Once but, fool, shame on me, twice fool, uh, shame yes, on you, one. twice fool, shame it, on me. Yeah, that Exactly. One. But I, I have to agree with you that um, they could have been um, collaborating. That is the nature of the call that I put out in April. And um, to my knowledge, that has not happened in the manner that would get things built as we speak. But I also know that a great impediment has been the absence of resources, if, the absence of, of assurance that there's a means of recoupment. But they're so, billion dollar companies, they have resources. They also have shareholders and they also have responsibilities uh, within their organization. I can't account for that and I'm not going to defend it. I'm just gonna give you my solemn assurance that I'm not gonna see the cuds hurt as best as I can. You will forgive me, though, if my first priority is the kid who doesn't have anything. Mm -hmm. And that's true for us, too, Commissioner. Absolutely. Right. We are, we are mm -hmm. completely and aligned. Frankly, I think it's the priority for the Cuds as well. That's why they yeah. exist. Yeah. If so I could, I, Madam Chair, just one, one more thing. Just yeah. I think um, I appreciate where you're coming from, Commissioner. I think what, what we're struggling with is I... I'll speak for me. I think I can speak for me and Senator Campion, but since he's not here, um, I think we do uh, have I'm, a track. I'm here. We, oh, I mean, <laughs> that next to me, I can't read your body oh. language. You see, we're sitting oh. right next to each other, oh. Brian. I miss you. Okay, what I want to say is this. Your perspective is that we don't have the history of a track record with some of these providers, and my perspective is actually we do. And I feel like even the fact that they haven't collaborated up until this point is kind of a track record. So I just, I just wanted to be clear that that's, that's my frustration. Well, I think that may be partly where you and I agree and why the proposal that we've been looking at for eventual federal funding gives the CUDs the primacy of, of role that we've been, we've been giving them a serious, or that's our proposal, is to give them a serious role in deciding what happens with the auction. It's not, I don't mean to say that I'm not um, cognizant that the industry has clearly left a problem, but I, I, I just think we don't help ourselves intellectually if we don't take in the full picture. And my full picture requires that I look at federal law and that I acknowledge that in 1996, a a terribly bad decision, in my view, was made in Congress to go strictly with market dynamics and to not give any thought to what's going to happen when you have an entire swaths of the country that don't have somebody to meet their needs. That's what we gave up when we walked away from the regulated uh, framework that we had until then. It was a good decision in that it brought you a very robust internet and cell service and the like, all of the innovation that was not happening under the old regimen, but it has come at a terrible price for us in rural America. And so I think this state has taken enormous strides and to good effect, if you look at the progress as Senator Campion was pointing out of the formation of the CUDs, what we're talking about today, I think is a comparatively small sliver that has to, if, if we're gonna take advantage of it, it has to happen now. And 
you know, we're, we have to make a judgment about how much we're willing to risk for what end. The end is to get kids connected who we know are out there and don't have solutions. And what we were risking is that some of those connections are going to detract from the business case of the cuts that we are all trying to help. And I, I think we are able to find a solution that is that, that can that can meet those interests without doing lasting harm to cuts. And I, I hope I've conveyed to you, Senator Ballin, that you and I are in full agreement about the the need to support cuts. And I, I do understand um, your reservations about industry. Yep. And I am there with you, but I am also talking to these people and mm -hmm. teaching them chapter and verse. Vermont has changed and you need to deal with it. Thank you. It, to their benefit, they will. I think what may be holding us back than other than EC fiber, the, cut, the cuts haven't reached yeah. the point of development where they're a threat. So you need to talk to them because they're, they haven't impacted the providers yet. Um, well, another way to look at it, Madam Chair, is that the inaction that Senator Campion and Senator Ballant have pointed to, to me suggests that the CUDs are very much a threat and industry would like to see them die on a vine. <laughs> now, there's, there's that yeah. interpretation too. But you have before you, I think, a witness today, Mr. Goldstein, who's going yeah. to speak to some of this. And um, you know, he may be able to give you some additional insights into um, how you balance these things. I, I just would want to leave the committee with two messages, or three, three really. Please do something with this money that furthers connectivity. Um, please uh, gamble on the, on, on what is possible, recognizing that we're not gonna have a perfect success. And uh, thirdly, just realize that if the money isn't spent by December 20, it goes back to you and you have many other needs for it. Dr. Pearson. Thank you. Really quickly, because we're running out of time. Well, no, Senator Brock, it's true. You've, you've been run over a few times. You go. Thank, thank you, Dr. Pearson. Uh, All I wanted to do was re remind the committee. Oh, he's got a blue hand up. I'm not looking for blue hands. Well, we were both up for quite some time, Madam Chair. Uh, All is right. to remind the committee that at 631 this morning, Senator Kitchell wrote us indicating yes. that she wanted these numbers by mid-afternoon. And I just want to make sure we didn't forget that. So oh, I'm Pearson, not forgetting I, it. Uh, Maria, to draft uh, a proposed amendment that does reallocate some of the money, and we haven't uh, had a chance to discuss that at all. No, we were going to listen to our two speakers, who I believe you brought to us, our two experts, right. and then we are going back. Um, I've told Sandra Kitchell that we got this bill yesterday, and... I'm going to do my best, but I, you know, to try and get something of this magnitude out in two and a half hours, which is what we've got this afternoon, I think is uh, somewhat an unreasonable expectation. I, I agree, but the one thing that I wanted to, to ask for clarification is, uh, were we to agree on the blocks of money uh, so that the Appropriations Committee could do its work, Presumably, we would still have time the remainder of the day to today and into tomorrow to discuss some of the content or the wording of the particular okay. section within Let, the bill. I will email the chair of appropes and ask her if that would work. Okay, Senator Pearson, have you got a? Yeah, a couple of really quick questions. In this area where we're worried about line extensions that could compete with CUDs, is there any? reality to the idea that uh, you might give it to Comcast under the condition that it be open access? Would they ever go for that? As I said, I at this point, I think we need to gamble. And if they won't go for it, then they don't get it. It's, sure. yeah, that's sure. basically it. Mr. Purvis? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I just want to uh, say a couple things about the line extension program. Um, one that it, it models an existing PUC rule for cable video service, 
and what we're doing is paying the customer's portion of, of that cost so that there's a formula there that divvies up costs to the carrier and costs to the consumer and we're simply just trying to cover the cost uh, that the consumer would feel um, yeah. under that formula. Um, and, and two, I, as far as it hurting the CUDs, I think the way it's written right now and the amount of money that's in it, um, I, I don't see it having a lasting long-term uh, negative effect on CUDs. We're talking about five homes there, two homes here, and it's completely consumer driven. So it's the consumer coming to us saying, I want this service now. Um, I, I don't see it as a, a mechanism for doing a widespread build. Um, it's, it's really just to help consumers who are reaching out to us asking for help with something they're already trying to buy. Okay, do you think they buy it if we made it open access? If that was the solution, I hear you say you don't think there's a problem, but. Uh, no, I, I, I think that would be problematic. Um, I, I think that uh, cable companies would, um, uh, would, would not want to participate. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I don't, I don't, I'm sorry, my children have just walked in, so I apologize. No problem. Uh, Let me ask one other quick question, and that is, sort of around the CUD veto. I worry about the 30 days. That seems really long, given the uh, absurd schedule we're on. Um, if we um, sort of set it up where it's five days, um, you know, people are going to be watching this closely. So I, I don't think that we have too much risk there. And then you guys have to in my in my mind you would give anyone five days or some short term to comment you could then do the analysis of whether or not it was going to be detrimental to broader last mile effort we're making and, and use your judgment does that seem like a smarter way to go compared to the veto or is that workable from your point of view yeah, I think that that is probably a better way to go, especially with the shorter time frame. Um, I think it puts CUDs in a difficult position, frankly, of basically telling their own constituents, you can't have this broadband now. And I, I don't know that they necessarily uh, are going to want to do that. So I think that they would probably invoke the objection in very limited circumstances. Um, one where they really are going to do something near term. Um, certainly if they think they can do this in six months or 12 months, uh, maybe they have a good case. But as you pointed out, uh, many of these CUDs were formed this past March. Um, they've just put their governing boards together. They don't have uh, any service yet. So, um, you know, for them, uh, I, I don't know that they're gonna be put in a very uh, good position vis-a-vis -vis their, their customers, um, their future customers. But also um, competition isn't a bad thing and CUDs are going to have to learn to compete. Um, I just don't think that $2 million investment in uh, incumbent carriers, including EC Fiber is going to mean uh, that much of a difference to, to new CUDs. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. I'm gonna move us on because our um, next witnesses are here and I'm going back and find my agenda. Okay, no, that's the agenda. Let me, here we go. Um, we have, and in no particular order, uh, Sandra Brock, do you wanna do any kind of an introduction? I know you brought these folks to us. No, you're muted. I do not have uh, each gentleman's bio with me. We have uh, Fred Goldstein and also uh, we have Larry Thomas here, both of whom are uh, experts, and as we define as a as former expert witness, I would always define an expert 
as someone from more than 50 miles away who has a dark suit. These gentlemen, though, <laughs> do have superb backgrounds in broadband, and uh, I asked them to come after having discussions with them last week uh, as we're wrestling with this decision of how, uh, what kinds of technologies to use, what are the pros and cons, what can we realistically expect to do in the time frame, and just to get some perspective and also to determine whether or not at some point the legislature might want to hire uh, uh, an additional consultant to help us uh, in our oversight role, but you know, certainly there have been no commitments made in, in, in either way, but I'm very grateful to both of them uh, to be here today. And I would ask each of them uh, before they speak to at least quickly outline what their background uh, is in this to help put that in perspective to us. Okay, first one I have is Mr. Goldstein. Are you there? Yes, uh, I am here. Uh, uh, okay, there you are. The way that the Zoom works, you, your picture bounces around. Okay, did my video pop up okay? Your video is working just fine. Yeah. All right. Um, so welcome to the Senate Finance Committee, and thank you for being willing to be here and help us. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Fred Goldstein, and I'm a principal of Interrail Consulting Group. I've worked in the telecommunications field for over 40 years and have done substantial amounts of work in Vermont. I've been an expert witness for the Department of Public Service in several cases, including Fairpoint and consolidated service quality issues, <clears throat> E911 failure investigations, and the regulatory status of Comcast's telephone service. I'm working now with the Central Vermont CUD, CV Fiber, on their feasibility study and business plan. I've also been the engineering designer for the wireless broadband network being constructed now in four towns in northwestern Massachusetts bordering Vermont. And I'm also the FCC technical consultant to the Wireless ISP Association. Um, in Interrail, we are independent consultants. We don't favor a technology or a vendor. We work with public sector and private clients on telecommunications and network related projects. And my own practice has often focused on rural broadband. That's basically my background. Um, and uh, I've, as I've been working for many years in related fields and worked on fiber as well as cable and wireless matters. Okay. So anything you think we should know? Yes, now um, let me, uh, basically what um, I've been proposing, I'm not gonna read my statement because that, um, that would I think be, we all have that. That would be a waste of time and take too long. The basic problem is that it's hard to get service to the rural areas of Vermont, and wireless is the only way you can do something in the six months remaining for certain tranches of money. You can't realistically pull fiber in that amount of time, new fiber, given the time it takes to do pole attachments and engineering and ordering and everything. That's a very good long-term solution. Uh, it might be possible to do some cable extensions quickly, but again, that only will reach limited areas. So to reach other areas, the fastest way to bring service is wireless. Now, that's not going to get you, you know, gigabit service, but it will get you pretty good service. Um, there are two different kinds of wireless network. And I want to clarify, there's fixed and there's mobile, and they're not really the same thing. Um, a fixed network has an antenna, and really it's called a CPE, customer premise equipment radio, that's mounted outdoors at the customer's house. It usually belongs to the network provider. It's part of the network. So it's not like a cell phone you buy at the store. The CPE is like a dish when you go to Dish Network and they have to have a professional install it and align it. In fact, many of the same people, you know, that's where we get a lot of the labor force. So you, you put up an outdoor antenna and align it on one of the base stations of the fixed provider. Uh, these operate usually on unlicensed bands. Uh, the power level on unlicensed frequencies is relatively low, but the larger CPE antennas often make up for it, so we can get a range of several miles depending on the frequency. Um, even in some cases, uh, 15 miles on uh, some of the uh, lightly licensed frequencies we use. So that's basically the, the approach for fixed. 
Mobile is different because it has to reach inside the car, a handheld device. Mobility itself is complex. And so mobile requires a licensed frequency. It's, uh, these are auctioned, they're expensive. So in terms of capital, mobile is literally orders of magnitude more expensive than fixed to create uh, in general. Now, there's an interesting hybrid of the two where a mobile network has capacity that can be used for fixed. And one of the places that's most used in the country is in fact, Vermont. Uh, VTEL has a few thousand fixed customers on a network that it built about you know, nine years ago using mobile technology, a very high budget mobile network, and it does support mobile traffic. It also supports fixed. Um, I'm not proposing that VTEL be the service provider to all the unserved people, but they have resources that we can work with. They have licensed spectrum, very good licensed spectrum that they will be using in some places for mobile and some places for their own fixed, but that in places that aren't even economical for them that they haven't considered for their relatively high capacity fixed network. I have spoken to Dr. Gite and we, we can make arrangements to lease the use of their spectrum and even lease the parts of their network core needed to support it. Uh, where there's fiber, we could build small cells on existing fiber and where there isn't, which will be most locations, we could use, we could build microwave backwall very quickly. And so basically the idea would be, we would locate, and I've already begun to do this using some, uh, list, using the department's list of unserved areas and VTEL study of where they can reach um, and where some, I know some of the existing providers are, we can put up some number, order of magnitude 100 would be the total we'd probably need for all of the significant gaps in coverage, uh, places that would reach a dozen to several dozen unserved users in hollows and valleys that don't even get cell phone service today. And this would be in addition to what VTEL was planning on doing with high capacity cells that they would also make available uh, on a wholesale basis uh, to use. So, and those would be in the more populated areas. So really that and the combination working with existing wireless ISPs where they have service and where they can build out their service um, in, in purely fixed networks, that's the fastest way to get something. And I say something, we're talking usually 25, the 25 and three or 25 and five class of service. Um, in some cases with the detail licensed called band 12, 700 megahertz license, which is what most of their current rural services, we're not going to get 25 out of that. The total capacity of the cell isn't big enough just because of the size of their license. We'll get at least 10 megabits to customers. And again, to people who have nothing now, 10 megabits is, is, be is better than most DSL. It's a considerable improvement. And then over time, you know, the CUDs can build out to there. The CUDs can build out fiber. The CUDs, I'm working with CV Fiber. And really the plan is to pull fiber to the majority of places, but there are those isolated houses where it would cost well more than average to reach those houses. And given the economics of CUDs, it doesn't make sense to be spending, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to reach a property when you can reach it wirelessly at a much, much lower cost. Wireless is much less expensive technology. Uh, so really will be primarily, the CUDs would be primarily fiber, but in the short term, we could fill the gaps with wireless. And even then as fiber builds out and as cable builds out, if it does, there'll be fewer people using the wireless, but it would still be there if it's tied to the VTEL network, it could still be used for roaming, for mobility, so that cell phone gaps in coverage in these remote areas could be filled in by that network, uh, still be there for mobility, and it would still be there with less load on it for the relatively smaller number of people that still need that because they're in remote locations. So it, it kind of works as a short-term palliative um, and then as a long-term, it'll still have some residual use even as we build out fiber. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive. The small cells we're talking about 
uh, the basic cell transceiver for band 12 is about $16,000. So put up a pole, put up a transceiver and an antenna. We're talking in the 20000 20 to $25,000 range with a microwave backhaul. Um, add a BRS, higher capacity radio to that for another $10,000. And that way we'll have for the area served by that small cell, these fill in gaps that are not served today, these most remote locations will have high capacity, those who can see the BRS at high speed and lower speed, but still adequate connectivity to the people who can only see the band 12, the 700 megahertz. So that's sort of a hybrid approach. The tricky part is an organization because VTEL and does not want to repeat some of the bad relations it's had in the past. It, it would be happy to sell wholesale to a sort of a neutral body and then um, that body would deal with retail. Retail doesn't want to be selling the retail either. Uh, and there'd be other providers as well. We're not trying to give retail an exclusive. It's just they have these very unusual licenses that are very valuable for bands 12 and especially band 41, the BRS band that has very high capacity. So we'd really be taking advantage of their licenses as well as the unlicensed CBRS band that uh, others like Cloud Alliance are using. Uh, to really round out coverage. That would be the, the short-term answer. It would require some engineering, quite a bit to locate places to put the poles. It would require, make sure that, I, that section 248A doesn't prevent the planting of utility poles for the purpose of supporting these antennas. There'd be no huts. The, the, the small cell concept is it's a pole, wooden utility pole, cabinet on the side holds the batteries and what little equipment goes there. The radios themselves are actually mounted on the antennas on the top of the pole. And it's literally just another utility pole, 50 to 70 feet, maybe 80 feet up, but it's wood, not a, and so it can go on a roadside right of way. We're doing that now in Massachusetts, the network in Florida, Hawley, Monroe and Savoy, just south of uh, Stamford and Reedsboro is being built using um, over 30 roadside poles in the roadside way that are actually the prop will be the property of the towns. So that's just a way to, to build this. It, it's not towers and it has to not go through the tower siting process, but through the utility pole siting process, which is presumably a little easier. So, so that's sort of the fastest way. If we can make all that work and have an organization it might be one of the power companies. It might be some, you know, maybe the old VTA could have done this, but they're not active. So someone has to come in and be this neutral body that doesn't have any negative relations with any major parties. And then that body would coordinate and make, you know, make this happen. That's really, to me, the fact, it's not easy. It's almost a moonshot but it can get service to people who, to thousands of homes that today otherwise don't have broadband and wouldn't have broadband any other way within the six months. That makes it eligible to use the COVID funding while it's there, that otherwise I don't see how much of it could be put to use uh, within the available time frame. Okay, What's the capability of the, of the up and down? Uh, well, okay, on the band 12, the idea would be in the worst case, if someone's deep in the woods blocked by trees, band 12 penetrates trees. And so really that would be a 10 and two type service. It might go faster, but I would characterize it and market it as a 10 and two. Um, if it's the BRS band on a small cell, I'd market it as a 25 and five. So, it'd be, but it probably can go faster. BRS, Dr. Gite's forecasts are that the vast majority of the homes that he can reach, and that's a majority of homes, he's got the ability to reach most homes in Vermont at over 75 megabits per second and potentially over well over 100 on his BRS network. So I'm talking about the ones that don't reach the 100 odd sites he's on. And those would be small cells and because they wouldn't have the expensive equipment, I like to be modest and say it's 25 and be happy when you get 50. But, and, and you often will, but it, it does depend on the quality of the path, the distance, how many, tr really how many trees are in the way. Where there, are, where there are trees in the way, you fall back to band 12 and you know, it's still better than most DSL. Okay, so this is the system I remember talking about 
actually, I think it was Mary Evelyn, Mary and Tom, who were pushing this when we, the last time we were going to become the connectivity state. And it's where there's a transmitter put up in somebody's barn. And then the houses down the road have an antenna on the roof and they get wireless broadband that way. Is that exactly how it's done? In fact, okay. I say poles because, you know, if you're in the woods, it, it you could be poles. Them. But yeah. in fact, in the Wireless ISP Association, the, the classic site in the middle parts of the U.S. is the grain leg, which is the, I never heard of one before working with them. The grain leg being the thing in the middle of three silos that pumps, it's taller than the silos that feeds them. So these are over 100 feet high. And basically, you give the farm free service, put the tower on the grain leg to over the silos. Uh, there are VTEL towers on silos. There are cloud alliance uh, towers, VTEL antennas on silos. There are cloud alliance antennas on silos. So yes, barns, silos, steeples. Um, if you could go inside a steeple with a, you know, plastic fake, you know. Yeah, they've been renting, putting cell towers in church steeples for a while. Right. And that's the idea. And we fall back in Massachusetts. We, since we're in the woods in a very sparsely populated area, we just use utility poles. They don't have. It's not farm country. It's it's you know it's woods country. But yes, certainly it's exactly the idea. In fact, Tom's name has come up as someone who could play if if he were interested in coming out of retirement. He might be a person who could play a role in this. Madam Chair. I, I thought VTEL had, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought they had really failed in this state. I mean, I thought VTEL, it sounds like you're advocating for possibly a return to VTEL, but unless I'm misunderstanding something from other folks, VTEL is, is I don't know, I want to say persona non grata, but has not uh, really stood by its commitments. Am, am I missing something? What I was suggesting is not that VTEL would build this. VTEL does want to build some, extend its network in the high capacity areas. That's their plan. They've asked, they're talking about RUS money to upgrade their network, but that's not for reaching the most remote areas. What I'm talking about is having the state purchase and own the small cells. VTEL would just lease- We have a lot of small cells. So I mean, a warehouse full of small cells. I don't mean I don't mean <laughs> the ones that you have left over from Vanu. Those were those were kind Our of one problem is going into this is we are not ending up with another warehouse full oh, no. of small cells. Not not no. the ones that I'm looking at actually are ones that are commercial. I'm looking at for band twelve. They're made by Redline. They're a standard product. It's a it's a standard cellular product, and it's compatible. They're a big with small network. cell. It's, it's, I mean, it's not a big box, it's, but it mounts yeah. on the pole, but it's a box that's been pr in production for years. It's an actual product. It's 4G. It's a 4G LTE. It's not old GSM. There's no, you know, experimental okay. technology. This is just 4G a standard. is good. This 5G is, starts to give us public problems. Yeah, 5G. And that's the funny thing, because this 5G is a minor change from 4G that I, somehow people have <laughs> gotten carried you know, away. <laughs> Silly. But you are, I have a provider who tells me it's all, it's part of the Russian um, interference in the internet, and it's a Russian story. Yeah. But, the, you know, we're not going there. It is problematic publicly. Oh, yes. It gets a very emotional response here. That's right. And, and that's why what we're really doing here is to say the state would be in charge of this. The state would work with an entity that would run this network. The state would own the small cells. They would lease them back to VTEL for VTEL roaming, but VTEL would be, in effect, a wholesale customer on these cells in exchange of potentially, because VTEL has the radio licenses, the spectrum licenses. So this would go. Detail hasn't, you know, hasn't, you know, stood up to, or you know, uh, fulfilled its 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 mission, its priorities in this state already. Why would we do something with Vtel? I mean, it just it just seems just doesn't seem to make any oh. sense. They hold the band 41 license. The reason is they're sitting on Spectrum, and that's FCC exclusive licensed mobile Spectrum. And that we, you know, and the idea is to make use of it more than they were able to themselves. It's it's very much to avoid having to deal with VTEL. I 
I, you know, do work with Dr. Gitay a little bit. I'm, I'm, you know, I like, sometimes I think of myself as the only person on good terms with the Department of Public Service and VTEL. I try to, you know, work with everybody. And I do know there have been some issues, significant, many issues uh, bet between the two parties. And so this would not be trusting VTEL to do anything. This would be using VTEL's licenses that we can't have, their, their okay. licenses, okay, um, and also using their network on really an open, what we call a neutral host basis. It'd be a neutral host. It would be not just supporting VTEL. It would be just making use of their facilities with a wholesale contract red that, again, doesn't trust them to do deployment, it would be bringing things to them essentially. Um, and we could rebuild a core ourselves. The core was, they, they spent a few million dollars on a core 10 years ago. I can buy a core today for $10,000 plus $30 per customer. The price has come down, the entry level. It's, it's used to be a very expensive package. Now it's available as a piece of software you run on a server. So Fred, and you're not talking about giving public funding to VTEL. No, not to only in the sense that VTEL sells service, not to give the money as the provider. In the set, we'd probably be bartering Spectrum, quite honestly, bartering potentially Spectrum for, you know, use, you know, for letting them roam on it. But and but it wouldn't be to give VTEL necessarily direct money. They 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 probably wouldn't mind if we if a deal could be made, but they're trying to get our US money for their big build. If there could be state money, they'd be happy too. But I understand their issues there, and I don't want to overcome. I can't overcome that. I just know that they do have resources, they do have spectrum, and they're willing to work through a third party. That every you know, as long as we can create a third party relationship. Okay, I, I think yeah, there's there's differences. I believe that VTEL used federal or RUS money the last time. They didn't have any connection with the state, but I don't think that what got delivered was what a lot of people expected. And I think that's fifteen percent. I think. Well, they yeah, overestimated. So, yeah, they overestimated. Anyway, I've got Senator Brock. We've got one more speaker, and we're running out of time. And then I'll get Senator Ballant. Randy, you're muted. That was my point, Madam Chair. I, I think it would be useful to move to the next speaker so that we have an adequate time uh, with him and then perhaps hold any additional questions for Mr. Goldstein until the next speaker has spoken. Right. Okay, Senator Ballant, do you have one last wrap up? You're okay? Okay. I'll wait until we discuss All right. as a group. Okay, then we're on to Larry Thompson. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senators. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfectly. Okay, good. Um, I have a couple of slides to share, and as part of those slides, I'm going to give you my introduction as well. So let me just share those with you now. Are you able to see my uh, screen? Perfectly, yeah. Okay, good. Um, just to give you a little background on who I am, um, I work for Vantage Point Solutions. Vantage Point Solutions, I'm the founder and CEO. Um, we started in 2002. I uh, got a physics degree initially and then went on for my master's in um, electrical engineering. I've been in telecom over 30 years, do a lot of satellite, wireless, wireline engineering. I'm one of the 29 members that... Uh, FCC Chairman Pai appointed to the Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee, the BDAC. Um, I'm also on various many in industry groups for NECA, NTCA, and various other things. Vantage Point, uh, by way of a little bit of background, we've got over 350 on staff, over 500 clients. We do work for a lot of small telephone companies. We work for cable TV companies. Um, a lot of rural work, although we do work for some of the larger companies like Google and things like that also, but primarily small rural um, broadband providers. We do both wireless and wireline engineering. We manage about 10,000 miles a year of outside plant fiber construction. Um, we deal a lot with regulatory issues, cybersecurity, do a lot of business analysis. I've got cost analysts on staff. 
And um, like Mr. Goldstein said earlier, we're also vendor and technology agnostic. We don't resell equipment. Um, just to let you know, I'm not being paid by anybody to be here today. Um, I'm not lobbying for any business or anything like that. I'm here because I just believe in, uh, you know, broadband. And uh, I think that everybody, uh, you know, better broadband means better life. And I think the people in Vermont deserve that as well. Okay. I think we're on the same wavelength there. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you for um, being with us. Yeah, and we do work, like I said, wireless and wireline. I'm here to answer any type of questions. I've, I'm a professional, licensed professional engineer in over 20 states. Um, so I, I deal with these kinds of things on a, on a daily basis. I've seen, you know, because we have such a large client base, I've seen what works and what doesn't work uh, from uh, the state government as well as federal government perspective. Um, as you know that you, there's a big urban rural digital divide and we see that in Vermont as well. Right now, somewhere between 20 million and 40 million people in the US lack access to 25 meg down and three meg up depending upon um, who's doing the counting and how you count. Um, and a lot of the reason is just because, just like Vermont, it's because a lot of the areas are not economical to serve. The problem that Vermont has of uh, getting broadband out there is not a technical problem, it's an economic problem. Well, along that line, may I ask a quick question? Sure, yep. Uh, so if a CUD came to you with a million bucks, how quickly could you get get fiber uh, put down? Um, that's a very good question. I do have some short and long-term strategies I'm gonna end up with. Now there are providers, out, established providers. You know, I know Mr. Goldstein mentioned VTEL, there's several others. Um, most of them have long-term plans and are able to uh, move plans forward to be able to uh, um, accelerate them. A lot of them have materials and inventory. Um, so the, there's a lot of varied conditions. Vermont is not an easy place to construct in, as you know, which is part of your problem as well. Um, but I would think when you're talking about the type of dollars, you're talking about 10 to 15 million. Um, there's probably quite a bit of pretty decent long-term solutions um, for that amount. Now, if you said it's 50 million, that That's would probably be a, another story. Sense, can you give me a sense of timing? That, that was sort of key to the question. If, I, if a CUD comes to you and says, I've got, you know, I've got a couple million bucks, how quickly can you build out that, infra, uh, construct that infrastructure? Years, um, months? Generally speaking, if you are starting from scratch, it can't be done. So like it would take a month or two of planning to figure out um, how am I going to route the cable? There's permitting processes that have to be gone through. Um, there's vendors you have to award the contract with. There's right now a couple of months lead time on fibers and then all of the installation. But there's enough providers out there that I believe, you know, have materials. They have a five-year plan. It's I won't, don't want to call it necessarily shovel ready, but it's not too far from being shovel ready where they could get out and do those quickly. Um, I don't know every provider well enough in the state of uh, Vermont. You know, Mr. Goldstein's much more tied into your particular um, providers and particular state issues. So it's difficult for me to say one way or the other on that specific of a question. Well, in your experience doing this for other groups, are we talking like two months, four months? No, I would say if you're starting from scratch, like if you went out to a, an existing, and I'm saying established provider, not somebody who's trying to get into the business, but an established provider. So it'd be one of the small telephone, it's Waitsfield, Champlain Valley, or somebody like that. If they were starting from scratch, like it, I was saying, it would take a month or two of planning to design the network and get permits, a couple of months to order materials, get contractors in place, and then a few months to actually do the construction. So if you're starting from scratch, six months is not going to be enough. But let's say, for example, that same telephone company or cable company or whoever it might be has a project planned for next year. It's already engineered. They've already been working on the permits and environmental issues and things like that. So they've already got a running head start. That's what I mean by shovel ready. And if they have the materials in and they can start construction within the next few weeks, then it could actually be accomplished by the end of the year. 
Thank you. Um, the average broadband speed in the United States is um, uh, over 140 meg nowadays. The National Cable Tel Television Association believes that more than 80% of the in U.S. can get one gigabit if they were to order it. They have access to one gig, more than 80%. Vermont has less than 20% of the population that's capable of 100 meg. If you've seen the Broadband Now statistics, and I'm sure you have what they published this year, Vermont is ranked 47 out of 51 when we include uh, Washington, D.C. Um, wireless and satellite is not going to solve the user's speed and capacity needs long term. You know, I think it can provide, it's going to be great. You know, like Mr. Goldstein said, if, if there's somebody who doesn't have broadband, 25 meg is going to be great. Um, but long term, it's not going to satisfy their needs. I speak a lot when it comes to 5G wireless and things like this at national conferences. And I, I can certainly come back and talk more about that uh, some other time if you want. Um, a good broadband infrastructure lasts 30 or more years, but it does take a lot of planning and effort to do it right. All networks nowadays are based on a broadband backbone. If it's wireless or wireline, everybody is in the process of pushing fiber closer to the customer and everything's fiber rich nowadays. When we talk about wireless networks, it's really that last little piece that's wireless, everything else is fiber. Um, but all aspects of American life nowadays, and we've seen it mostly recently with COVID, but communication, education, healthcare, entertainment, agriculture, you know, a smart farm, smart cities, all of that rely on broadband. Um, Broadband increases property values, higher tax base. Mitchell, South Dakota here, where I live, our headquarters is at, um, we actually uh, were voted in the top seven most intelligent communities of the world. And a lot of it was because of the jobs we've created and the broadband network that we have in place. Vantage Point, by the way, we did more than half of the successful uh, grants for the New York, the $500 million that New York did and did most of the engineering work as well. So the problem is Vermont's got significant areas that lack broadband, your terrain, topography, your environment make broadband deployment difficult with your hills, mountains, even wireless, wireless and wireline, your state parks and forests, um, there's a short construction season. So you don't have a very friendly environment to be building these uh, broadband networks and you lack of a real well-defined broadband strategy, but not to say that's unusual, most states don't have a good broadband strategy as well. And normal market forces, as you've realized, I've listened to you talk the last hour, normal market forces haven't closed that gap. And I don't see any technology on the horizon that's going to close that broadband gap um, because of the economics. Um, like I said, all broadband networks rely on fiber. Um, it's time consuming. You design and engineer permitting and right of way both for buried and aerial construction. Environmental studies are often required. Um, you know, doing wireless, you know, even takes time getting licensed spectrum. Uh, Mr. Goldstein mentioned the spectrum that VTEL has. Um, one thing to keep in mind, you know, that's one spectrum, one piece of the pie. You know, there's lots, there's hundreds of licenses out there that other entities own as well. Um, you need to permit for towers and radios. Um, and we're currently experiencing some material shortages. Everybody realizes how important broadband is and a lot of people are doing it. So let me talk a little, I've got two slides left, one on short-term considerations and one on long-term, and then I'm happy to, to answer any questions. But, um, you know, you can use your short-term, you know, your CARES money for some short-term, fill in the gaps, it would be Band-Aids, the timing is just terrible for good long-term solutions, as I was just talking about earlier. Um, the money spent quickly, though, is probably going to be spent less efficiently. It's going to be invested in things that maybe uh, are not good long-term solutions, but maybe that's um, still acceptable. Um, you know, you're going to take more risk, um, and they may not uh, fit into the big picture later. Um, you may probably need to focus on existing broadband pro providers because they have the experience and you're probably not going to be able to do too many startups in this short of a time. 
some long-term considerations. Um, you know, being good at identifying areas that lack broadband and other digital needs. And it sounds like you've done a fair amount of that already, developing a state comprehensive broadband plan. Now, one thing I see that's probably the most successful is not necessarily the state owning everything and designing everything to the, to the last bolt in fiber, but at, at a minimum, you know, focusing on goals, principles, areas, and not so much focused on technologies or specific network types. Um, kind of like the FCC has been doing, you look at what they've done in CAF phase two or the RDOF and things like that. They've set established goals on speeds and capacities and latencies and uh, letting market forces after they solve the economic problem, letting the market creativity figure out the best solution. Um, having a strong state broadband office seems to be successful in um, the states that have done a good job in deploying broadband. Um, encourage shovel ready projects. When money falls out of the sky like it has for the CARES program, being ready to um, have projects that are quick and easy to get done. And I think once you've established these goals and principles, that's probably a logical follow on from a lot of the private companies. They'll be ready because they know that the next time um, an opportunity comes along, they want to be ready. Um, and then continue to raise the bar. 25.3 might be adequate for you today. I think a lot of people would argue it's not, um, but next year it's gonna be 100 and then it's going to be a gigabit and then 10 gigabit. The cable TV companies now are working on DOCSIS 4.0. They actually have the standards done that's going to allow 10 gigabit services rather than one gigabit. And that's the way the trend is. So set your bar high. That was my last slide. I know I hit a lot of things. Um, what kind of questions might you have? Committee. Sandra Brock, you're quiet. Um, may, I, may I, Madam Chair? Uh, yes. Thanks. I can't so, see you. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's Brian. Uh, so it sounds like what you're saying is the CUDs, uh, which will lay fiber, not cable internet, um, that'll raise property values. Every time, you know, when you look at businesses and residential, yep, one ahead. of the, oh, I'm sorry, one of the common things they ask is what kind of broadband do you have? Houses and businesses that have broadband uh, capable networks that are attached um, sell for more. Here in Mitchell, where we have two different providers that you can get gigabit services from, the first fiber of the home network went in in 2005. It's been a huge recruiting tool for the economic development to get new businesses to the town. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I think he also said, if you're a startup, there's no way you're going to meet that six month deadline. And that's not right. even caught, you know, the, since we had snow in May, the possibility that it's 90 or we have a blizzard in October is hanging out there. The weather is more erratic than usual. And, you don't build a lot in December in Vermont, so. But Madam Chair, wow. could a CUD, and I'm not sure, could they subcontract to get people on a network by the end of the year? That seems possible. I, I, I think that's, if they are at a stage where they're ready to do that, I don't think there's anything that prohibits them. It's, they do that. Yeah, it's just hit at, a time where most of the CUDs are a couple months old and they're just haven't gotten, they aren't developed enough to do all of this work we need done. So we're kind of walking between the world we'd like to see in the future, but the need to improve things now and quickly. Um, I think when I meant when I talked about short term, um, I think you're going to have to make compromises this year because of those timing constraints and not do everything that you really would like to do. Um, I think that's a great idea for next year when you have more time to plan. But it's like going out and 
telling GM to build your car or to have a new startup come up and build a car. You've got to hire employees. You've got to do all sorts of stuff that an established provider doesn't have to do. And when the timing is this tight, um, you don't have time for all of those other things to, to get over that learning curve. I think our challenge is to get as many people hooked up with as high a capacity as we can get them without doing harm to the future, which envisions the CUDs as the provider of last resort. Um, what we lack is money. Senator Brock and then Senator McDonald. I think that's what I've seen. Okay. You're muted. Larry, you've listened to a lot of this discussion today about the dilemma that we're in trying to make some decisions on how best to deploy uh, uh, funds between now and the end of the year, recognizing that what we deploy has to be up and running by the end of the year. And based on what you've heard, if you were in charge of this in Vermont, what would you do? <laughs> well, um, there's no doubt, like Mr. Goldstein mentioned earlier, that wireless can be deployed faster than fiber. Um, it's generally though, I will say even for wireless, you know, like he mentioned towers and things need to be installed. Generally, those are fed by fiber facilities, not always, but generally you need fiber facilities to get out there. So it's not that it's completely devoid of fiber, it's less. Um, so generally you can deploy it faster. It's generally a lower CapEx, but you also have to remember the life expectancy is a lot shorter as well. So you're putting in a network that might last five years if you're lucky. If you put in a fiber network, it's gonna last 30. So if you look at maybe a wireless network where you're gonna to have to replace it four or five times over a 30 year time frame, oftentimes when you're looking long-term, fiber is oftentimes less expensive, wireless is uh, less expensive in the short term is what we normally find out. Um, some of the uh, spectrum, you know, you look at 700 megahertz or even BRS, maybe not so much as BRS, this very small slice of spectrum and you're only going to get, you know, a, you know, a small amount through. And I think Mr. Goldstein did a good job saying plan on 10 meg for the 700 megahertz and maybe 25 for the BRS. Um, that's still, you know, well below what the national averages are. But like I said, somebody may be doing backflips if they can't get anything today. Um, I would probably, though, to answer your question, what would I do today? I would, and it's one thing you can't sit and study it very long because the more you look at it, the shorter the amount of time. And that's why I said this year, you're going to kick yourself next year for some of the things you did because maybe they weren't the most efficient, but it's still got more broadband out there. I think you've got some time to do it right next year. You can do it 70% of the way right this year. I would probably start by pinging some of the established providers and see how many of them could potentially um, move some projects from next year into this year and get some more people connected. Maybe their CapEx this year was $2 million, but they could do $4 million. And it might also be a way that you could multiply the benefit of the you know, 11 or $12 million that you're planning on using for this is maybe it's not you don't buy the whole thing, it's, but it's a, a dollar for dollar match or, you know, something, like I said, it's an economic problem. If you can take those providers and uh, solve that economic hurdle for them, the problem is in these rural areas, the end user revenues, even over a 30 year life expectancy of the fiber is not enough to pay for that investment generally. Um, I know it was mentioned earlier about um, the regulatory changes. And part of the problem was in 96, it was great that we got competition, but all of these providers, the low cost customers in town were subsidizing all those high cost rural. And now that there's competition and they lost their town customers, they can't afford to do the rural anymore. And so you need to get those providers over that economic hurdle where they can afford to make those uh, rural guys essentially look like a town, which means you've got to get the cost per subscriber per location down to somewhere around $5,000 or so, which was what it cost to build out a town customer. Right now it's 10 or $15,000. So if you can essentially buy them down and look like it's a town customer, I think you could get the existing providers very interested in serving them themselves, um, which may be a, a good option for you. 
Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. okay. Senator McDonald. Um, have you run across uh, arrangements where um, public money has been used to us? Uh, have you run across arrangements where public money has been used to go to uh, private uh, operators, uh, uh, cable companies, and in exchange to put up fiber and exchange, the cable company has um, left half of that, half those fibers available for CUDs or local cooperatives? Sure. Um, one thing you're going to run into, and I heard your discussion earlier about um, these line extensions. Um, cable systems um, are, do not adapt very well to open video, you know, open networks where, you know, it's usually a small portion of their network. Nobody wants to access their network at that point. And so when you do these line extensions and you're putting these, you're pushing essentially fiber deeper into the network and you're asking them to shorten that last coax drop from, you know, maybe 500 customers down to uh, 200 customers or 100 customers. And so they would push fiber closer like all providers are doing. And you say, well, put in a 144 cable at that point, and I want you to dedicate half of it. Normally, it's a small run. It's not in an area. It's in a neighborhood where probably nobody is going to be able to leverage it very easily and stuff. So some of these things sound good in theory. Um, in reality, if it's practical, it's probably uh, sometimes more difficult to, to leverage. Now, if you're talking about an entire town where you're overbuilding, where Maybe you can put in some extra conduit or some extra fibers, or let's say you're running along one of your interstates and it's going to be a long run. Those can certainly be leveraged by others. But if you're talking about small jobs where small line extensions, I don't know that's going to be val very valuable to other people. Okay. Sandra, you look puzzled. Do you have another question? I'm stymied, Madam Chair, for the moment. Uh oh, that is a first. <laughs> okay, any other questions? I think we're overwhelmed. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for right. being with us. Thank you. I think this, I think, helped us step back and get the 2,000 foot view from a, a, a national perspective. And I think um, we were inclining to get into the weeds. So committee, we have 11 minutes. And I think Vanessa wanted us to sign on five minutes ago. Um, I don't know how much we have on the floor. Um, so I don't know if we can come back afterwards. Other than that, I have not gotten an answer back. I did email appropriations and told them if we could come up with the tranches, um, the big buckets for where we wanted to put it, could we have more time to come up with the criteria for awarding grants? Um, Senator Pearson. Uh, Madam Chair, if Maria has, sent Randy and I, and we haven't had the chance to look at it, I assume, uh, some of the concepts we've been working on with her. Okay. That, that if we have time after the floor, maybe would be helpful. It, it, it's- um, Walk through- the Questions you've heard Randy and I ask, I think we're trying to poke at whether or not we had any good ideas here. So I, I don't know okay. if that's helpful, but if we have the chance, he and I do have something we could work off of. Right, okay. and we do also have additional money that uh, Senator Kitchell has suggested that we could use if we could effectively deploy it. Okay, and I think the, the first question is, do we agree with the tranches that the House bill has? Um, one of the big ones is dedicated exclusive to wireless, I think. No. No, it's not. But one of the men did it. Is that the one that mentioned wireless? It's both. It's both fiber to the premise and wireless is in and the wireless. Piece. Okay. That's the largest piece. And one of the things that Senator uh, 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 
Pearson and I have talked about is providing a little bit more flexibility there to the department to make decisions based on the reality. It, it's that whole decision of not knowing what people can in fact deploy within the time frame we have will actually dictate to some extent what we do. And we wanted to give them a little bit more flexibility than they have in the within the narrow confines of the house bill to be able to do that. And if it sounds like wireless can provide better than nothing, better than DSL, but it's fairly easy to put up and fairly easy to take down. So it, and it lasts five years, if you're lucky. So- Well, well last more than that, because for one thing, what we're talking about also as part of that is the, the, tape, the feed that goes to the wireless providers and, and that, that feed may very well be cable uh, ideally. Now, one of the real questions is, can it can can we use existing feed and then replace it uh, by fibers? Right. You gradually uh, deal with uh, increasing the capability of the network, and then ultimately, at the end points, disconnect the wireless and then move with that same feed the wireless to the home. In other well, words, that's, yeah. to get us down the line of where we want to go, we're not going to do that strategy this afternoon. But conceptually, that's something that doesn't seem to be beyond the realm of possibility. Yeah, I think that's what I was thinking, is that if we put up some wireless, it does not preclude three years down the road if your local CUD is ready to run the fiber, because the fiber, you know, people are now used to broadband. The, the fiber is now more attractive because it'll give you better, better broadband and it's easier to dismantle. Unlike if we let a private provider go out and run cable or broadband, that would be a challenge to the future of the CUD unless they could buy it. So are, are we agreed that we'll try to come back if it's not a ridiculous hour? Yeah, if it's four or five, do you want to come back? Sure. I'm, I'm free in the morning. I don't know about other committees. I can do very early morning. We don't usually start until 10, but I have something at 5.30 that I could change. All right, well, I wasn't gonna go too late. People have families and dinner time. I was planning lunch at five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had lunch at two, so I don't need <laughs> dinner until about seven. I mean, we can. Sandra Sorokin, you're the one that's probably meeting. Okay. So I just want to second your idea of trying to decide the tranches and deal with language and guardrails tomorrow, because as Senator Brock knows, that's exactly what our committee did. We ran up against the yeah. deadline. We decided the money and said, we're coming back tomorrow to deal with the language because we can't do okay. it. Okay. Well, let's try, because we're going to about be ready. Let's hope the Senate doesn't go more than a half an hour. We can get back here and maybe work till 5.30. Does that okay. work? Fine. Unless if we all sure. roll up our sleeves and, okay, that sounds good. All right.